All right, so today I'm going to be giving you guys a review of the presentation Dr. Dietmar Schmidt Bleacher uh, gave on stochastic resonance therapy, um, the implications it's going to have on new innovations in sport training um, and disease treatment. So let's get into it. So first, question number one is how do we handle unexpected perturbations um, in our environment? The answer to that is res that responses are organized um, in your spinal cord, and that spinal cord has two jobs. Number one is to figure out where you want it to go or where your body wants to go in order, like in response to this perturbation, um, what's, the correct re what's the correct movement response to that? The number two is figuring out at what time you need to do so. So essentially what that means is like how fast you need to be able to do that and then where um, do you need to be able to go to correctly respond to the stimulus. So um, question number two then becomes what specific role does the spinal cord play? So there's really three different things. Um, stretch reflex, which is responsible for amplitude and velocity of the stretch, um, but mostly velocity, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, reciprocal inhibition, which inhibits the antagonist and increases the effect of the agonist. And then cross extensor reflex. So the cross extensor reflex is seen during walking and running, where we have flexion on one side, then extension on the other. So you can think about as your, let's say, left leg comes forward into flexion, the opposite leg is going to be going back into extension. So how that kind of works, um, the reflex system uh, involving your spinal cord doesn't actually need the brain. So the raw pattern comes from the brain um, down to the spinal cord, but the reflexive reaction of the body uh, is done through the reflexes, which again comes from the spinal cord, which means that you don't need the brain um, when the reflexes are coming from that spinal cord. So if we isolate the stretch reflex, um, how it happens is very similar what we have in cars, right? It's a damping element to overcome bumps in the road, um, which is essentially what our muscle spindle does. So the sensitive part of our muscle spindle is in the middle, and it's very sensitive to amplitude and velocity, but it's actually four times more sensitive for the velocity. Um, therefore, when training uh, stretch reflexes, we want to make sure that the velocity is very high um, so that the stretch reflex is adequately um, stretched or affected, which means the, the depth of what we're doing, like let's say we're doing a depth drop, the depth has to be enough, right? It has to be high enough. And then also the surface that we're landing, landing on has to be hard um, so that we can make sure that we make that impact. A soft floor is going to be easier on your joints. Um, that also means that's, that the stress is lower uh, and the adaptation will not be nearly as great. Uh, one thing to remember is stretch reflexes were developed as a means of survival uh, to keep us from falling. Like when we're falling on our face or we're landing from a high height, right? If we have to jump off. Um, a fence or something like that, or if, we're, if we trip and, and we fall and we're about to hit our face, um, stretch reflexes were developed as a means of survival in those situations. So in order to train them, it needs to be done in a survival type situation or with that type of speed um, or environment. So this is looking at the actual timing of like how long it takes a, a muscle or, or a stretch reflex to actually initiate and then force a muscle contraction. So it's a 1A afferent signal um, going back to the muscle. So from 28 to 30 milliseconds, um, we see that we have enhanced electrical activity in the muscle. Uh, from 30 to 40 milliseconds, or 30 to 40 milliseconds later after that, there's then a full muscle contraction. So in a time of less than 100 milliseconds, we can have a maximal muscle contraction. Um, if, it's just, if it's a situation where Let's say we trip, we fall, and we have to avoid smashing our face into the ground, right? So it's helping us to survive. Uh, the legs take a little bit longer due to the, the um, distance that it has to travel. So in that situation, uh, it's roughly 43 to 47 milliseconds before the force production process begins. And then again, after 30 to 40, that's when that full uh, muscle contraction would happen. So in sport, uh, we look for the acceleration signal and ballistic perturbation. So we can see that the contractions in the graph there um, are happening under 75 milliseconds uh, due to that stretch reflex. So we know um, from previous research, and again, this is all taken from um, Dr. Dietmar's uh, presentation that he gave, right? All this info is, for, is from that presentation. Um, but we know that ligament rupture, ruptures take place in under 200 milliseconds. Uh, so it's the action of the stretch reflex that can actually help our body stay bulletproof and protect against these type of ruptures um, in those situations. So we need to make sure that we're training this stretch reflex.
So here's a look at some uh, conventional methods of training that are used in the rehabilitation of uh, ligament tears, like for instance, ACL tears. Um, but the problem is because of the response time in these conventional training methods, which as we can see uh, in the graph here is over 350 milliseconds, right? They've done, um, or they've put EMGs on when doing this training um, and the response of that muscle is actually over 350 milliseconds. So we know um, as a result of that, that we're not actually training uh, at the speed that the stretch reflex occurs. So we're not really learning something that's needed for our survival um, or for our performance, right? It, the, these modalities can potentially be beneficial for other things, but we're not actually targeting that stretch reflex. So there's no reduced risk of re-injury um, when using stuff like balance board training. Uh, if you have an ACL rupture and use conventional training methods, um, like or, or conventional rehab methods like we have right now, um, versus if you just start right away in the field with the actual exercises, um, the actual exercises on the field are going to be better, assuming that you handle them correctly, because we need to train that stretch reflex to be used in that fast period of time of 100 milliseconds. And, and here's why. So after an injury, um, obviously that area of your body hurts, right? And if your reflex system is working correctly, it's going to cause that area to hurt even more. So because of that, the body inhibits that stretch reflex, um, so that it's no longer working. And, and if we only rehab with slow measures, such as the conventional train that we see with trampolines, balance boards, um, we're not going to properly develop the recovery of that stretch reflex, right? So we'll, we'll never actually work in that 100 millisecond range, range of time. Um, if we're only using these conventional methods for, you know, however long you have until you get back on the field. So when you get back on the field, you're now at high risk of injury because you haven't addressed this stretch reflex uh, response time. So a little background on the SRT. Um, it was originally developed for skiers. So we know that with skiing, uh, the longer that you keep your skis on the snow, um, the faster you're going to go. So the SRT can actually train them to better utilize their stretch reflex, which we can think of as um, shock absorbers, so that they had better control of their tiny or of these tiny and involuntary signals um, sent from the spinal cord, and they could better control the amount of bounce uh, that they had in the snow when going over uneven or rocky terrain. So just a little backstory, he took old skis, a skateboard, um, oval tires from his wife's washing machine, and he tells the story um, in the presentation that he gave. And he fixed the whole thing on a treadmill, and that's what you see in the video that we have above is the original SRT that he used um, for skiers. So now, obviously, it's a little bit more uh, modern, and they made some updates. So now they have a platform that moves in a three-dimensional manner. So it moves up, down, side to side, tilts, forward, back. Um, and in the overlay between these three different movements, we have a high-frequency signal, which is produced um, from the brakes of a car, actually. Um, that's what they use to produce that high-frequency signal. But the device ultimately allows the athlete to have 5,000 stimuli in 10 minutes if it's uh, in the range of 6 to 8 hertz. Um, and just one thing to keep in mind that he mentioned is if you go too high with the frequency, uh, your receptors will actually not be the ones doing the work. So um, you need to make sure that you keep kind of that uh, the frequency low so that your receptors are doing the work and your, and your bigger muscles aren't actually um, responding to that stimuli. So now we're going to look at some of the actual effects that it had um, in different situations in, in which they've tested it. So this is the effect on the general student population. Um, they stood on the SRT for eight weeks. They had three workouts per week on the SRT. And as we can see in this graph here, right, you can see the red versus the black student versus specialist. And the specialists were going to have, essentially they're going to be able to take force and dissipate it so that they experience less ground reaction force. So... When they put these students on the SRT for eight weeks, um, three workouts per week, they were able to actually help the students lower the, the amount of ground reaction force that they accepted while standing on the SRT. So what this means, obviously, is that their stretch reflex was becoming better trained to be able to handle these random perturbations. So the breaks that we talked about earlier, right, the, the car brake analogy that we had where it's essentially learning to dampen um, the, the force or the signals that we get into our body, they're now becoming better so that they're able to better absorb the force um, that they're experiencing. 
So essentially, they, they took the student and turned them into more of a specialist, right? They didn't get all the way. They only did eight weeks, but they made the student more like a specialist just by standing um, on the stochastic resonance therapy machine. So what we're looking at here now is the, the same uh, population, and they re also recorded EM, EMG activity. So they're looking at the uh, reciprocal inhibition that we talked about earlier where you have one thing turning off on and then the opposite muscle so the agonist turning agonist or antagonist are working in opposition of each other one's turning on one's turning off so they wanted to see if the actual uh, reciprocal inhibition pattern would get better in these students so what we're looking at in the graph is we want the red to be all when the red is all the way up we want the green line to be essentially at its uh, valley so we want peak with one color and then valley with the opposite color. And we can see, or what they found in this study is they started, when they first started, they saw co-contractions of the of this agonist and antagonist. So both flexors were all the way on or extensors were all the way on, right? It's one or the other. They, they weren't working in opposition of each other. Um, but after eight weeks, they actually saw a reciprocal inhibition where flexors and extensors would very quickly work on and off uh, in opposition of each other. So this process uh, happens roughly 20 times every second. So every 50 milliseconds, your, um, <coughs> excuse me, get some water. So every 50 milliseconds, they're actually switching. Um, and that's too fast to organize from the brain. So like we talked about earlier, uh, these signals are actually coming from your spinal cord to initiate this reflex system. And if we were to look at an EMG graph of a high performer, it would actually be more pronounced than what we're seeing um, on the screen here, right? So if you look at it, an elite athlete, it means that the, the line would actually come down to zero. So when one is turned on, the other one would be completely off, and then they switch and go in opposition. So again, they saw, they saw these students go from co-contractions to actually being able to have reciprocal inhibition, even though it wasn't as good as a, let's say, elite athlete. They still help these students improve, which essentially means that th they're helping these students become more high-performing athletes just by standing on this SRT. So I thought that was a really interesting part of his presentation was that just by standing on this, we're learning how to use reciprocal inhibition uh, more in our favor, which is what elite athletes essentially do. Here's a look at balance. Um, so pre versus post. So in terms of balance, uh, the more sensory information that you take in and interpret, um, the more precise your motor pattern is going to be. So I think we mentioned this earlier, but the SRT provides 5,000 stimuli in just 10 minutes, um, if you have it on the correct setting. So this can be used before you rehab or before you train um, as a way to essentially provide the spinal cord more sensory information, which means your motor pattern after that is going to be much more precise. Right. If you're if you have time to practice receiving these inputs and accurately responding to that, once you step off now, the sensory info that you get in is going to be able to like you're going to be able to filter that better and then have a better response to that as a result, which means that your motor pattern is going to be better. Uh, analogy that I gave was if you start a race car uh, with the tires hot, you're going to get much better results than if you start with it cold. So with the SRT, we're essentially getting the tires hot. Um, before we go into our training. Here's a look at the signal um, that normal vibration plates give versus the signal that stochastic uh, resonance gives. So normal vibration plate gives a um, sinusoidal signal and what we actually or what we actually talked about was that you don't find these signals um, in the natural environment in natural situations. So if the sinusoidal signal gets too high and hurts, um, the kidneys start to move and it actually becomes dangerous. So uh, some of the conventional um, vibration plates, if they were to go too high, they could have this problem. Um, this does not happen with stochastic resonance because the movement is always different, right? So it's not, it's not like a consistent vibration pattern. It's always a different pattern so that your body doesn't get used to it. Um, so each strep, uh, stretch receptor that we have has a threshold and... For that receptor to be able to detect a signal, the stimulus has to be higher than the threshold, right? That's pretty basic. So in a sinusoidal signal where it's the same every single time, uh, the signal is either above the threshold or it's not, which means that this the receptor 
is either always firing or it's not, right? With stochastic resonance, the signal is variable. So therefore, we're continually jumping over and under that threshold so that your receptors are constantly turning on and off. And what we actually find is that nature has these uh, typical stochastic resonance signals um, everywhere, right? Walking and running on uneven floors is an example. Um, he gave an example of waves. So when the waves hit the bottom of the ocean, um, or, or when water hits the bottom of the ocean, they come back up as waves. None of those waves look exactly the same, right? We're not seeing sinusoidal waves where every single wave is exactly the same speed, the same height, right? They're complete. They're different and their own wave. Um, so he, he was just pointing out that what we see in nature is probably what we should kind of train through. And we see stochastic resonance in nature. We don't see sinusoidal signals um, in nature. So we need to train in that stochastic resonance type of uh, way. Uh, here's just another look at the detection threshold. So essentially what this is saying is that it takes less energy for us to um, respond to a stochastic resonance signal versus a sinusoidal signal. And this is important because obviously we were designed um, to survive, right? Our bodies were, were designed to survive. That's what we care the most about. So in terms of just like um, essentially doing what's best for our body or, or what's most natural for us, a signal that requires less energy to detect um, is going to provide us with greater results. Neurotrophic factors. So when you do any type of exercise, um, you get a neuro neurotrophic factor release, um, which these factors regulate the proliferation, survival, migration, and differentiation of cells um, in the nervous system. But we can see here with this graph that the release is incredibly higher in SRT um, as compared to a normal sinusoidal uh, signal, which would come from a, a general vibration plate. Uh, survival of dopaminergic neurons. So the survival of these neurons is incredibly dependent um, upon the individual doing exercise. But I think one of the one of the cases where this SRD can be the most beneficial is when the client actually cannot exercise when they lose when they lose their ability to to move as they would like. So handicapped wheelchair stroke MS Parkinson's patients um, any of these type of patients. Obviously not all of those are fu fully immobilized but they might not be able to do as much exercise as they normally could. So when we actually look at exercise and the amount of uh, uh, release that happens, you don't get a whole lot from standing isometrics. Um, there's a small release from swimming. There's a huge release from running, uh, specifically when it's anaerobic and you produce lactate. Um, spatial and time variations uh, make this, even, this release even higher. So when you do something on a, on a sinusoidal wave, uh, like a normal vibration plate, the brain has no reason to give the receptors any energy because there's no new information. Um, and with the SRT, what we have is we have this kind of spatial and time demand, right? Because it's moving in, in randomized directions at randomized speeds, right? So it's going to be much closer to that running where we saw that the release is going to be even higher. So that just kind of shows the, the benefit that SRT can have um, in these type of immobilized patients uh, versus something like a normal sinusoidal signal because you're going to release much more of this uh, or you're going to you're going to the release is going to be much greater in this or on the SRT versus when using a sinusoidal signal. So here's a look at uh, postural sway uh, specifically with MS patients. Um, so essentially they th these MS patients that they looked at started with having started with having roughly five to six uh, forward falls per day, right at the start, we can see in this graph. Um, and then as they progressed with the training, they were able to walk three to 4,000 steps per day uh, without these falls. And they would stop the SRT. So they had stopped the, the rehabilitation with these patients um, when the patient could walk that three to 4,000 steps per day unassisted without falling. So they saw, they saw it to be very beneficial um, in these MS patients. Uh, here's a look at spinal cord injuries. Um, so what we're looking at here is th they were they were rehabbing patients with incomplete spinal cord injury. So they both did it, both uh, the control and the experiment group did exactly the same. But the people that we see with the blue bars um, did 10 minutes per day in the SRT. And they did this for eight weeks uh, with retesting every two weeks, which is what we see in the graphs. And what they found was after eight weeks, the control was able to walk 75 meters in two minutes. So that's what they were testing is how many 
meters could they walk in two minutes. So the control group was able to do 75, but the experimental group was able to do 125 meters. And again, the only difference that these two groups had was that the experimental group used the SRT uh, for 10 minutes per day. And we see a pretty drastic increase in the amount of distance that they're able to cover um, in those two minutes. Here's a small look in what it can do in patients with Parkinson's disease. So as we can see, their tremor improved uh, by 25% and their rigidity improved by 24% uh, after only five series on the SRT. Continuing on with that Parkinson's disease uh, uh, population, this was one particular um, client that they worked with. And there's much more research that's actually been done on this with Parkinson's patients um, outside of what I'm presenting here or what he included in the presentation. So if you'd like that, um, send me an email, give me a call, shoot me a text. I have my contact info at the end uh, of this presentation. I'd be willing to share um, all the research that's been done on it so far. There's been research done on it with Parkinson's, um, MS. Uh, there was a case study on back pain. Um, they're starting to look at how it can help ACL rehab in terms of like actually researching and studying that. Um, so if you'd like any of that, send the, or shoot me an email, send me a text, give me a call, and I'm happy to send that over. But what we're looking at here is the writing. So you can see pre and post. So we talked earlier that the basal ganglia or, or the brain is, in, is important when we're looking at small and accurate movements, right? So kind of up to this point, we've looked at the SRT as a way to help um, the stretch reflex as a way to help spinal cord, as a way to help kind of these, these unconscious reactions. But what we're seeing with this writing is that improved. So there's probably, there must be something where the SRT is actually um, improving their ability to use the basal ganglia uh, in these slow and accurate movements. It's not yet clear how, um, there's also been a study done on uh, the effects that it has in the basal ganglia, but there's only one as far as I know right now. Um, again, I'm happy to send that over if you'd like to see that. Cortical activity. So if your nervous system is hit uh, with a new task and you can solve it, you get a large dopamine response um, from solving that problem, essentially. So each time you stand in the SRT, um, it's going to be a different situation. It's going to be a different problem for your body to solve because it's, again, completely random. Um, so therefore, each time you step on it, you're going to get that dopamine release because it's a new problem for your body to solve. Uh, they also saw higher cortical activity in people that are exposed to SRT, um, which again could explain why the motor control is better in patients after they've been exposed to the SRT. And again, that's probably because they're getting that variable stimulus coming in, so they have to get better at reacting to that stimulus, which then makes their motor control better when they get off um, because now they've had the practice of those 5,000 inputs and reacting to those 5,000 inputs. So finally, just a little summary um, of, of what kind of we went through in the video that you see here is a look at all the different programs that it can run. So it has neurology, it has um, orthopedics, it has pediatrics, and then it has symptom related and sport. So you can kind of uh, see all the different programs that it can run under those titles. And then you can also go manual with it. So you can actually program the trim and, and the noise of uh, the duration, how long you want it to break and all that you can do manually as well. But just a quick summary, increased neuromuscular activity, uh, reduced neurodegener neurodegenerative effects, uh, enhanced neuroplasticity, improved information selection and improved postural control and locomotion. And I think the whole point of all this is that, uh, before you start your exercise, if all these different things are um, improved through use of the SRT, your system is now prepared and ready to go. Um, it's going to be fire, firing on all cylinders. Uh, if we think about kind of that race car analogy, I think that's a really good way to think about what this can do um, for the general or for the athletic population, but also for the general population, it can do obviously much more um, in terms of like actually rehabbing them, right? It's important for both but it can have different effects um, on those two populations. This is just kind of in general what it can help do. And then when looking at the specific population that you're working with, uh, we can look a little bit more closely at what it can do for that population um, and, and how it should be best used. So I wanna thank you guys uh, for taking time to watch, taking time to listen to this. As I said, here's my contact info. Um, I'd like to mention again uh, that this was a summary of the presentation that Dr. Schmidt Bleacher gave um, on the technology several years ago, years ago, um, in all credit 
uh, for the information that I had here, the graphs that I had, um, the videos that I had, a lot of them were ones that we took uh, in our own training facility um, where we actually, or I actually purchased one and I'm using it. I love it. Um, and that's why I'm so passionate about this. And I was willing to put out this kind of review is because I've used it myself and I've seen the benefits that it can have. Um, so if, if you're wondering, like, I'd be happy to talk about how we've used it, our experience with it, um, and anything that you have questions on there. But if you're interested in, like I said, further purchasing or learning about this technology, uh, you can reach out. My email there is Brady at deckbaseball.com. Um, and I can also be reached via phone at 989-551-9503. Uh, thanks again for watching.